Anyway, introducing OpenCL 1.2. So with OpenCL, we are on roughly an 18-month cadence. We come out with a new specification every year and a half, which if you've been involved with language standards, that's absurdly fast. But we have to do that because many core hardware is evolving that fast. So we have to keep up with the hardware. Uh, so every 18 months we come up with a new specification. So 1.2 was just announced this week. And I'm now going to briefly introduce it to you. But I'm not going to go into details. Because the most boring thing to do at the end of the day is listen to someone talk to you about uh, you know, some boring technical stuff. You can download it and read about it. So, OpenCL 1.2, it's publicly available, it's backwards compatible. We are serious about backwards compatibility, so you can run your 1.0, your 1.1 programs, um, you can mix 1.1 and 1.0 devices with the 1.2 platform, and we have, I, I thought we were going to have them here to hand to you, I'm sorry, but we have reference cards that describe uh, the, the 1.2 implementation as well. But you can download a PDF of the reference card, you can download a spec and everything. What's the schedule for implementations? Do you know? What is the schedule for implementation? That is an excellent question, and I have to tell you quite frankly, I don't have a clue. Because mm -hmm. I'm in Intel, I'm in Intel's research labs, so they don't tell me nothing. Um, and Ben left, so I can't ask him about AMD's plans, what they're publicly willing to state. And we don't have any other vendor sorts here. Any other vendor sorts in the room who has an implementation coming soon? No. Okay. Sorry. So, excellent question. I don't okay. know the answer. I hope soon. Uh, because at OpenCL, we put nothing in the standard that we don't have two implementations of. So, vendors have implemented stuff, you know, on internal. So it's sort of a product question. So, here are the sorts of things, and I'll have just a little bit more detail with this. And by the way, I'm not offended if you get up in the middle of my talk to go get more beer. Um, I might be offended if you get up in the middle of my talk to leave, but you know, getting more beer is a noble thing to do. So um, one thing we've added is the ability to partition a device. What this does is it gives you the ability to have more fine-grained control over how you split up the resources on a device. Uh, and that's going to be really important if you want to run multiple kernels, concurrently and you want to have some control over how that concurrency takes place, you can have multiple devices with multiple queues with the event model in between it. I'll have a little bit more to say about that. We also have a capability of separate compilation and linking. I'll say a little bit more about that in another slide, so I'll skip it for now. We then have enhanced image support. Basically, we've added support for 1D images and arrays of 1D and 2D uh, images. So uh, this is a very important capability, especially on platforms where you get a performance boost by using a 1D image instead of a buffer. So um, that's one thing we've added. Another thing we've added is custom devices. Let me tell you in OpenCL terms what a custom device means. Imagine you have an OpenCL program. You have a host program that sets up the environment, dumps commands into a queue, and you have a collection of compute devices. What a custom device is, is a device that can execute something, a command, but it cannot compile an OpenCL program. So it doesn't support the OpenCL compiler. So this means I could have, say, a, you know, a, a, a hardware function-specific device that is attached to the platform, that has an API it exports, and I can, I can access that API from within my OpenCL program. So this lets me put custom devices on there. And this is coming from the fact that we have people that make DSP chips, FPGAs, an incredibly broad array of people who build devices they want to attach to the OpenCL environment that aren't a CPU, aren't a GPU, don't have all the compiler and infrastructure you'd expect to go with that. And then, you know, there's the DX9 media surface sharing and DX11 surface sharing. And I have to tell you, I'm not a graphics person. And it's like, whoopee, I'm glad they've added that, but I can't begin to tell you what it's involved with. <laughs> but graphics people say it's very important and love it. There's an installable client driver. I'll say a little bit more in a moment. And then a bunch of little stuff. But those are kind of the big ones. So let me just touch on a few of these. So the partitioning devices, this is real important because, as I said, I can take a compute device, which has a number of compute units, and I can segment them. So let's say I want one device that I want it just prepared 
to service real-time requests, like graphics for updating my screen. And then I can have another device that I'm using for processing a workload. So, and I can split them up in different ways. So this is what we can do with partitioning a device, and this gives me a portable, abstract way to represent that I want multiple kernels running on a compute device at one time. But what are you partitioning? Are you partitioning the cores, the registers, the memory? What are you partition partitioning? The cores, the registers, the memory? You are partitioning the compute units on a compute device. And in the memory model, that defines how you partition the associated memory hierarchy with it. So it's expressed at the granularity of the compute units. And there's different ways you can split it up, and I'm not walking through the spec in detail, but you can break up the compute units in different ways. So this is actually huge. I think it's going to be really important in terms of expanding the domain of applications you can address with OpenCL. I'm really looking forward to working with it. Here's another one that when I first heard about it, I thought, that's really dull. But as I got deeper into it, I realized this is extremely important. So in the old style, that's the top box, you had to compile, compile. You had to gather together all the code for your kernel program, either load it all at once from a binary or concatenate all the strings. But you had to bring all that together in one place at one time, and then in one step, you compiled and built it to create the OpenCL program. Now, for those of you who are new to OpenCL, heck, I, I didn't do this. Can I see from a hand how many of you have written an OpenCL program before? Okay, see, you're all you're all experts. So. For even those of you who haven't, the idea is you build this thing in OpenCL called a program. And I always thought we really blew it with that name. It should have been called a dynamic library, because that's what it's used as. So you have this library called a program that you pull kernels out of. And in the old style, you had to build it all at once. Well, that doesn't allow you to do modular software. What if I want to import a module that someone else wrote? And they didn't want to give me the source code. They just want to give me the binary and expose the interface. Sorry, out of luck with old style OpenCL, because I have to be able to get everything in one place at one time and build it at once. So now by adding this, by separating compile and link, I can now compile or pull together multiple modules and then link them into that library object. So this in terms of growing up, in terms of moving from you know, a research platform, a, a you know, uh, uh, what do I want to say, something that only one group works with and builds, this allows us to do kind of mature, modern, more state-of-the-art type modular software engineering within OpenCL. Very important point. <coughs> um, I think I mentioned the custom devices and built-in kernels already, so I don't think there's anything on the slide I didn't already say. Then there's the installable client driver. This is an optional feature in OpenCL, but I think it's a real important one, and I know we talked about this at our tutorial. Uh, this is analogous to an, uh, an installable client driver from OpenGL. So if you know it from OpenGL, you know it from OpenCL. The idea is it lets you have multiple software development kits on a single platform at one time. I'm sorry, i got to pick my words carefully because the, the word platform refers to that SDK. So imagine I have an Intel CPU, because of course I'd have an Intel CPU, right? And I have an AMD GPU, and I have an NVIDIA GPU, and I want to run all of them at once on my platform at one time. Well, what am I going to do? Do you think the NVIDIA GPU SDK supports OpenCL on the Intel CPU? I don't think so. And, you know, so likewise, you, you need really the OpenCL that goes with each one of those devices. So the ICD lets me have multiple platforms installed at one time. So I can query and say, what platforms do you see? And I'll come back and say, I see one from NVIDIA, one from AMD, one from Intel. And I can say, great, well, the Intel one, how many devices do you see? And it'll come back and it'll tell me. So this gives me the ability to have multiple vendor open CLs that's in one program at one time. It's totally cool. But of course, you could just buy a system where everything's from Intel, and then you wouldn't have this problem. All right, so that's really all I wanted to say about 1.2. There's a lot of little stuff, but those are the big features. Are there any questions? Yes? You already have a platform SDK. It works. I, mean, I already I have run, a platform SDK. I run, I run Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA all at once. I see all of the devices. I see all the platforms. Why is that a new feature in 1.2? I don't understand. So you're running, you have ICD already? Yeah. Okay. That's all. So you have it already. Uh -huh. And you asked the question, so you get... An official 
open sale t-shirt. Oh, wow. If I ask another question, do I get another one? Okay, do we have any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, question first. Yes, got, it's got to be a good question, too. Yeah. As far as I know, it's not possible to create a com compute oh. context. I'm sorry? It's not possible to create one compute context with devices from multiple vendors. His comment is, is it possible to create one context with devices? Vendors. It is not. You're right. I have to have a separate context for each platform. Okay. So, good question. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? When you do... And by the way, if the t-shirt sizes I'm throwing to you don't work, you can exchange later. I have a few others of different sizes. When you... Um, when you're splitting a device into subpartitions, uh, and you have OpenCL code uh, that, say, uses the um, the global um, atomic operations, are you are you going to be requiring that that's going to be done on that particular partition? So if I have two separate, good question. I have to tell you that off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I think. Because you're talking about global memory, it will be visible to all compute units. Right. So I would hope those atomics would work across partitions, but I do not know. I'm sorry. You get a t-shirt, but I don't. I lose mine. <laughs> all right. We're going to go on to the next speaker, but be thinking up good questions. Oh, okay. Yes. For the, uh, um, the linking support, uh, does that mean that we now have a standard way of saving a binary blob of a kernel that we have? Uh, uh, there is a way to save a binary blob, yes. Is that across vendors that would work across vendors? Sure. I, mean, I, I mean, understand, not, yeah, within different. OpenCL there's a way to store a binary. And looking at my support folks here, I believe that there is a standard across vendors. But the same binary won't work across oh, vendors. Of course, yeah. 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 same yeah. binary won't work, but it's the command to store a binary. Yeah. Is, is, is now part of the standard. It's part of the standard. Great. It's my understanding. Okay. <laughs>